So DJ's dropped cable. His, what do you tell me? His second girlfriend found out about his third girlfriend. <laughs> so he went to Vegas to hide out. That's his problem. He has to deal with that. Um, so, all right, I've been gone. Uh, what, what happened to me? Well, uh, my wife had a kid, uh, and in theory, Aww. yeah, so let's be honest here. It doesn't look like me, <laughs> and I'm not sure it's mine yet, uh, so we're waiting for the paternity test to come back, so just hold off, hold off your awls, okay? Um, the other thing I want to update for you guys is that at the beginning of the semester, I said that I uh, only care about two things in my life. Number one was my wife. Number two was databases. So I have an updated version for everyone now. Uh, the new version is that my wife is still number one. Databases are still number two. And again, depending on the paternity test, the, the baby is, is just you know sort of there, OK? Uh, I'll say one thing to everyone here. It's Do not get pregnant or get anybody else pregnant before you graduate school. It is a nightmare. I have done nothing for, two, for the last two weeks except cleaning like poop diapers and like vomit and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's awful. All right, sorry. So my, my poor wife is at home now with the kid. All right, so for you guys that, that don't have any newborn children to take care of, here's what you have to do. So this is what's uh, coming up for you in, in the next month. Homework four is due two days from now on Wednesday at midnight. Project three will be due at the end of this week on Sunday at midnight. And then I will announce this on Piazza and post this on the website. Uh, we'll do the first checkpoint for the extra credit will be on, um, will be on, on Sunday, November 24th, after the one week after the project three is due. And so what the checkpoint means basically is you'll, you'll submit the URL to the article that you've been working on. The, myself or the TAs will look at it, give you feedback, give you suggestions, uh, tell you what looks right and doesn't look right, and then that'll give you uh, guidance to, towards the final submission. So I'll just say up front that you won't get full credit for the extra credit unless you submit the checkpoint. Right? If you just submit the check, if you just submit the final thing at the very end without giving, uh, you know, us giving you feedback, uh, you won't get full credit. And I'll, I'll update the, the document to provide information about all these things. And then after that, there's one more homework, and that'll be due in December, and there's one more project, and that'll be due in, in December as well. Okay? So we're almost done. Any questions? Okay. So let's talk about logging. So the idea of logging and recovery is that we obviously want to be able to persist any changes we make to the database after, after, whenever there's a crash or a failure. So to understand this problem, let's talk about the, the kind of system we would ha we've talked about so far, see what the problems are, and then we'll go back now and add logging and recovery, and we'll see how to handle the issues uh, with making sure everything is durable and safe. So let's say I have a simple transaction, T1, once you read on A, write on A, and at the very, very beginning, uh, there's nothing in our buffer pool. Like we haven't brought anything into memory. And we only have one page that has the object A in it out, out on disk. So when our transaction starts, it does the read on A, and then we go fetch that page from disk and bring that into to our buffer pool. And that's, we know how to do that. We've talked, about, uh, talked about, about that already. So now when I want to do the write on A, I modify the object as it exists in, in the buffer pool. Right? I, make, I flip the make, make the change. Then now my transaction says it wants to commit. What has to happen here? What does a commit mean? The, the, the application tells us we want to commit. When do we tell the outside world that your transaction is actually committed? Well, if we immediately say, they tell us commit, and we immediately say, well, you don't, there's no deadlocks, there's no timestamp violations or validation issues with your transaction. If we immediately tell now the outside world, yeah, your transaction is committed, what could happen? Well, our change is just hanging out here in memory. Okay, we passed it all our concurrential checks. That's all fine. But it's still sitting in memory. So now if like the most evil person for databases com comes along, like the Hitler of databases, just Hitler, if he comes and zaps us, zaps our, our data center or our machine and we lose power, then all the changes that were sitting out in, in volatile memory are gone. Right? We never wrote anything out the disk. So if we tell the outside world that when you, you know, immediately, hey, your thing committed and nothing got persisted to disk, we can immediately, you know, we could lose power right away and lose all our changes. 
And now we told the outside world you committed, but you come back and your, your, your changes aren't there. And that's bad. So this is at a high level is what the problem we're trying to deal with today, right? Called crash recovery uh, and the lo logging scheme is, is a mechanism we're going to use to prevent these things. So <clears throat> the recovery algorithms we're going to talk about today are the techniques that the database system is going to use to ensure that all the changes make the changes that transactions make will guarantee that the database is consistent, all the changes are atomic, and all the changes are durable. Right? So we care about A, C, and D in the asset acronym. We don't care about isolation for what we're talking about here today, because that's sort of handled by the convergence control protocols. Like that's worrying about you know, who can read whose rights. This is really about how can we make sure that our changes are atomic, consistent, and durable. So every recovery protocol or mechanism is going to have two parts. The first are all the things we're going to do at runtime while the system is running, while we're executing transactions and queries, that will, get, will set us up so that if we have to recover after a failure, we're able to do that and not lose any, any information. So the first part is all the things we do at runtime. The second part is if after a restart or if after a crash, how do we use the information that we collected from the first part when we were running normally to go back and put the database back to, to the to correct state? So today's lecture is focused on the first part. What do we do at runtime to make sure that we can collect the right information so that we, we, we can restore the database correctly? The second part is, was on Wednesday, if after we crash, we look in here and figure out what the hell we actually did and put us back to the correct state. So for today, there's a bunch of stuff we need, we need to talk about before we can actually talk about the method we're going to use. So first, we're going to talk about what kind of failures we could have in our system and, and how can we, you know, which ones we can, can recover and not recover from. Then we're going to start talking about how we actually going to manage memory in our buffer pool in a slightly different way than we've talked about so far so that we can ensure that we can, can, we can, we can recover after a crash. Then we'll talk about two techniques to do database recovery. The first is shadow paging. The second is right ahead logging. The spoiler would be right ahead logging is the, 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 the better way, is the way what every single database system actually uses, but it's good to know what shadow paging is just to see for historical reasons and see why this is superior. Then we'll talk about how to, how to do different types of logging and right ahead logging, like what, what's actually in the log record itself. And then we'll finish up talking about checkpoints, which then will segue into what we talk about on Wednesday to do recovery. Okay? All right, so the... The database system itself is going to be divided sort of conceptually into different components based on what the underlying storage device they operate on. Right? The buffer pool manager keeps things in memory. The disk manager keeps things on disk. Right? One's volatile, one's non-volatile. And then so, so based on that, we want to keep track of and, and understand how can these different components fail based on or have problems based on the different types of failures we can incur while we're running transactions, while we're running queries. And, in, and then based on that, we can figure out how, you know, what do we actually need to support in our recovery protocol. So there's three categories of failures, and we'll go through each of these one by one. Transaction failures, system failures, and stored media failures. So the spoiler, or the, 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 the heads up for what I'm talking about, we care about the first two, the third one is impossible to handle. And we'll see why as we go along. So transaction fares are all the things we talked about so far, right? When we talked about currency control. These are things like when, uh, like a, when the transaction has a deadlock or transaction tries to update something that it's not allowed to update or update a value in a certain way that it's not allowed to update, right? These are things that we can't allow the transaction to continue and therefore we have to abort it and roll back as changes. So again, logical errors would be the transactions trying to violate some internal integrity constraint that's, that's put upon the database or a referential, referential constraint. Like if you try to insert something with a foreign key reference and that foreign key doesn't exist, then the database system says you can't complete, your transaction has to fail. We've got to make sure all your, your changes get rolled back and never persist, even though if we, you know, we start multiple times. Internal state errors are the things we talked about on our two-phase locking and timestamp ordering. Right? If we have a deadlock between two transactions, we've got to kill one of them and abort them, roll back all its changes, and then you know, make sure that they don't persist after a crash. So our database system, our logging protocol, needs to handle both of these. These are sort of obvious. Then we get to the, actually the, the system failures, the hardware failures, uh, that we have to account for in our protocol as well. So the first is the software failure. These are where the, the database system itself is buggy. Right? There's some crappy code in the database system and like a divide by zero, 
and now the software system itself, the database system itself crashes, right? It gets, it gets a six of aborts. And so we need to be able to account for those kind of failures in our database system and make sure that, you know, any transaction that's still running, they get aborted and roll back correctly or any transaction that did commit before this, uh, this error occurred, all these changes are persistent. The harbor failure is when the actual machine that our database system is running on crashes or, or ceases, to, ceases to operate or runs. Right, this could be someone like tripped over the power cord or like there's a loose wire plugging into the, the disk drive. Right? The system has a failure and it, it can't keep running. The operating system you know, crashes, the, the, the database system crashes, and we need to come back and, and recover the database state. So in order for us to make this, you know, be able to handle this, we have to make this fail stop assumption. And that is we assume that the harbor is not going to suffer a unrecoverable damage if we have a hardware failure. Meaning like if, if, if we have a spinning disk hard drive and there's a needle riding on the platter, if we pull the power and the, the, the needle's not gonna like careen into the platter and start you know, mess, you know, messing up sectors. We assume that if we, if we crash, have a hardware failure, that we can always come back and, and re recover the correct state. So the last category of failures are the ones that we can't handle at all in our database system, simply because the database system, although it's, you know, as great a piece of software it is, it can't bend you know, the, the, the principles of matter to its own will. So a, a non-repairable hardware failure would be like the example of the needle crashing into the platter, or like if I light the machine on fire and, and melt all my disks, no database system can recover from that, right? So we're not gonna design our protocol to account for this. We can do other things, like just replicate the database uh, to overcome this, or maintain archived backups that we can recover uh, if there's a crash. But that's not really recovery in the same, the same way we're talking about today. Like, if I had to restore it from an archived version, that's just backup and restore. That's, you know, just me loading it in from a, from a, you know, a separate copy. That's not doing anything extra special, the, the kind of things that we're talking about today to recover the database state. So again, we only care about the first two failures. No database system can account for this, but through redundancy, which we'll talk about with distributed databases, we can, we can uh, try to avoid this or mitigate the issue. Okay, so the entire semester we've been talking about Discord and database systems, right? And so we've already covered this already, but now we need to sort of, sort of to go over it again and see how this is gonna be an issue when we talk about logging and recovery. So again, a Discord and database says what? It says that the system is designed such that the primary storage location is assumed to be on disk, and that anytime you want to read a record or manipulate a record, you have to first copy it into memory, into your buffer pool, make your change, and then eventually write it back out the disk in order to persist it. Right, this is the von Neumann architecture from the 1950s. It's not specific to database systems, but it's, just, it's, it's the operating assumption we're, we're, we're basing our entire discussion on. And there are some special newer hard drives that can you know, have CPU cores on the disk itself that you can try to manipulate the data down there, but that's just sort of moving the problem somewhere else. For our purposes, we, we can ignore that. We say, we want, we want to modify something, we bring it to memory, make the change, and then write it back out to disk. So the question is gonna be, when do we actually write those changes out? So when you guys built the buffer pool stuff uh, from before, all you're really doing is just saying, all right, well, this page should be evicted. It's dirty, so therefore I have to write it back out to disk. And you didn't worry about who actually made that change and whether it was the right time to actually write that change out the disk. So that's the thing we need to account for in, in our logging protocol today. So the, the basic guarantees we need to ensure in, in order to provide the, the atomicity, consistency, and durability guarantees is that if we tell the outside world that their transaction is committed, meaning we send them an acknowledgement, say you've committed, then all those changes are persistent and durable forever. Someone may come and overwrite those changes and update them, that's fine, but you know, before that, you know, those changes should always persist forever. And likewise, if any transaction makes changes and those changes make it out the disk, but then that transaction aborts or doesn't complete correctly before the crash, we need to make sure that we can reverse those changes as well. So those are the two main guarantees we need to have in our logging protocol. And the core principles we're gonna to use to in order to provide these guarantees are undo and redo, which are exactly as they sound. So with undo, it's basically information we're gonna, we're gonna maintain to allow us to reverse any changes to, to, to an object in the database that a, that a transaction has made. 
So it's like, here's what the old value used to be for this attribute, for this tuple. And I'm going to store that somewhere so that if I ever need to reverse the change that someone made to it, I can go, always go put, put the old value back in. And then redo is the opposite of that. Redo is the information needed to reapply a change that a transaction made to, to, a, to an object in the database. Right, here's the information on how to say, you know, here's, what the change, here's the change they made at this given time. If I ever need to go back and make that change again, I, my redo information tells me how to do this. So based on these two principles or primitives, we can now build on this and now start to build something more complex, a logging protocol that allows us to generate this information at the right time in, in the right way to allow us to restore the database after a crash. But how we're actually going to use undo and redo and when this information actually gets written to disk is going to depend on how we're going to manage disks, sorry, manage dirty pages in our buffer pool. So let's look at a more complex example here. We have T1, T2, T1 does a read on A, write on A, T2 does a read on B, write on B. So in this case here, we're not worried about deadlocks or, or concurrent control. We just assume that they're allowed to acquire these locks into whatever they need to do. We only care about this point is like the low level changes they're making to these objects. So we transaction T1 starts, we do a read on A. Uh, there's only one page in our database. And, and so in order to do the read for, on A, we gotta first bring it into our buffer pool and then the transaction is allowed to read it. Then it does the write on A, and again, it's already in our buffer pool. Assuming we can get the latch on it, we can go ahead and make our change, update it directly in place. We, we're, we're ignoring multi-versioning for now. We make our change right there, and then our operation finishes. Now we have a context switch. T2 starts running, it does a read on B. The page is already in memory, so that's fine. That happens right away. Then it does a write on B, again, already in memory. We, uh, we assume we get the write latch on it. We can make our change, and we're fine. So now we go ahead and T2 wants to commit. What needs to happen here? Well, there's two decisions we have to make. The first is, in order to be able to tell the outside world that our transaction is committed, should we force the, the, the buffer pool to flush out and write out all the changes that it made for this page out the disk? Yes or no? Yes, right? Because you have to, because otherwise if I crash, if Hitler comes along and takes, takes this away, all my changes are gone. Well, what's the issue? We've written uh, the A value. Correct. T1 modified A in the same page. So should I be allowed to write out a, a page that's been modified by a transaction that has not committed yet out the disk? He's shaking his head no, but what's the problem, right? B's in here, T2 made that change, but A wants to commit. It's allowed to. But there's this other change in here from an uncommitted transaction. So let's say that, all right, well, I take, it's better for me to write out T2's changes even though T1 hasn't committed yet, so I write, write those out the disk. But now I, I, you know, I tell the outside world T2 is committed, I go back to T1, but now T1 aborts. So what needs to happen here? Yes? Right, so I need to roll back the transaction, so I need to roll back the change it made on A. I can do that in memory pretty fast, right? That's not a big deal. But I wrote out the page to, you know, that A existed in with the change that T1 made out the disk. So now I gotta go you know, make that change in here and then write it out again to, to reverse the change that I made. What's the problem with that? Between the time that you wrote the page out the first time, you can crash before T1 aborts. Exactly. So he said, by the time I get my abort, I maybe I reverse the change here. But before I overwrite my change out the disk, I crash. Now I come back. I don't have any of this. I only have what's on disk. And now I have a change from T1 that I that shouldn't be there, but I don't know it shouldn't be there because I have no extra information to tell me that T T1 did not actually commit. So the two things we talked about here, where the two decisions we had to make were here. Whether we should require to force the, the transaction to write out all 30 pages out the disk before it's allowed to commit, and whether or not we're allowed to, to, to copy out a page or evict a page from our buffer pool from a transaction that has not committed yet. So these two policies are called steal and force. 
So the steal policy says whether transaction, whether database systems allows a uncommitted transaction to overwrite the most recent committed value of an object in the database out on disk before it's allowed to commit. So if you say if steal, if you're using a steal policy, then you're allowed to do this. If you're using no steal, then it's not allowed. The way to think about this is if I'm running out of space in my buffer pool uh, for one transaction. Is that transaction allowed to steal a page in the buffer pool or slot in the buffer pool from another transaction that has not committed yet? Right? That's why it's called steal. The force policy says whether we require that all updates that a transaction makes to any object in the database have to be written to disk first before it's allowed to commit. So if you say I'm using the force policy, then it's required to do this. If you're using no force, then it's not required. So forcing is going to make it, our life easier because it's going to allow us to recover really quickly because we just come back and we see all our changes are there, right? We don't have to you know, look, look at any other place to try to you know, redo information, to, to redo the changes. But the steal policy is going to be problematic because now we're going to be writing out changes from transactions that have not committed. So let's look at one way to do this. Let's look at the no steal force policy, right? Because they're sort of they're conf they have um, conflicting goals, and you, you know you can only choose you know two combinations of these two things. So no steal force means that no steal says that any uncommitted changes from any changes made by an uncommitted transaction cannot be written to disk, and the force says that any change all changes that a transaction make ha have to be written to disk before the transaction is allowed to commit. So. T1 starts, does a read on A, we bring that in a buffer pool, that's fine. Now we do the write on A, update the, the, the page in our, in our buffer pool. Then we do a context switch to T2, T2 does a read, then does the write, we update the buffer pool. Then now it wants to go ahead and commit. But again, the force policy says that all the changes for this transaction made have to be written out the disk, but we have this, this change from T1 hanging out here as well, so we need to get rid of that. So what do we need to do? Right, copy the page in memory, right, only apply the change that we want or reverse this other change we don't want, and then we can go ahead and write that out. So now when we, when, when we come back over here and we abort T1, now it's super trivial for us to reverse the change uh, that all the changes that T1 made because it's just updating this, this, this page in memory. We don't have to go out the disk because you know no dirty, dirty change got written out there. So the database system is going to maintain some extra metadata to keep track of the write set over these different transactions. You guys already saw this under two-phase locking and, and OCC under concurrency protocols. So we already have that information about what changes they made to what objects. So it's not that big of a deal or extra work we have to do to be able to reverse that change when we make that copy. Right? And it's in memory, so that should be pretty fast. So does this seem like a good idea or a bad idea? So what's one, what's, what, what's one good thing about this approach? I've already said it. It's actually right there. It's super trivial to roll back after a crash. Because there's, there's nothing to roll back. Because I know that anything that, that's on, out on disk should be out on disk, because they're all from committed transactions. There is deadlock between two transactions. What's that? Sorry, is there a deadlock between two transactions? Yeah, I don't know. Not, not a deadlock between the two drafts, but a deadlock between I mean, the first one wants to write, can give a copy and write the disk. And then at the same time, the second one wants to make a copy of its own and write the disk. But uh, it may overwrite the first one. So, his, so his, his question is going back here. In my example here, I have one thread or one transaction wants to write out something to disk, or it makes one copy, but then another transaction may be committing at the same time and it modifies the same page and should it make another copy. We can ignore that. We assume that I mean, you have to have a, a single latch to protect these things. There's no way to get around that. But we can ignore all that here. So there's, there's two problems. Actually, three problems. Yes? So you're close. So he said, 
the now when you're processing page to commit this copy here it's more work it's on the critical path or it's in the critical section of the commit the commit protocol for the for the concurrent mechanism that becomes more expensive yes absolutely right yes but more than just cpu cost it's actually the you have to write this thing out multiple times now like so say if you go back if you go here if t1 didn't actually abort and actually committed then in order to get its change to a out the disk i'm going to, have to write it out again so for every transaction that commits i potentially have to write out the p same page over and over again yes so when you're flushing all the pages before you commit it could be possible that you crash while we can implement the protocol when you flush all the other pages now you don't know which one you flush exactly you still need to flush. exactly so he's absolutely right so one big issue with this in, in my simple example here i have one page say it's four kilobytes the hardware can guarantee that i can do a four atomic four kilobyte page write but if I update multiple pages, the hardware can't guarantee that for me. So I could, if I update four pages, I write out the first two, then I crash before I get the next two. Now I come back and I don't have, you know, I have torn updates. So that, he's absolutely right. That's one big problem. There's another big one that's a bit more nuanced. So again, I have one page, so this, this is sort of a trivial example. But in this case here, for a given transaction, since I can't write out any dirty data from an uncommitted transaction to disk, that means that I can, my, my write set of my transaction has to fit entirely in main memory. So if I have a table that has 1 billion tuples, I have a single query that wants to update all 1 billion tuples, but I can only store 1 million tuples in my buffer pool, then I can't run that transaction in, under this, 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 this system. Because I'll hit the first 1 million, update them, that's fine. Then I try to get the million plus one, and then I'm running out of, I ran out of space. Can't you have a workaround where you write them out until like temporary, like a temporary spot? And, and... So he says, can't you, just, isn't there a workaround? Can you write into a temporary spot? Yes. Give me two slides. That is, that is, that is the solution. Yes. It's not a good one, but it's one. Okay. So no steel force is the most easiest way to actually implement a, a recoverable, correct, durable, buffer pool manager and a, a disk oriented database system. Because I don't have to do any redo after a crash, I just come back, my database is, is, is guaranteed to be in the, in the correct state. Um, and I never have to go, you know, undo anything from an aborted transaction at runtime because I know none of its changes ever made it out the disk. But as we said already, that you, you can't support transactions that have a write set that exceed the amount of memory that's available to you. Uh, the, the commit protocol is now more expensive because you have to do all these extra, extra work to figure out you know, what things actually should be written to disk versus not written to disk. And, the, um, and you're doing multiple writes out to disk uh, you know, for, for every, that could have just been one write. Now for every single transaction, you're writing the same page over and over again. And if you're an SSD, those things actually can't be written forever. Right? You can burn out the cells in the SSD. Right? And, you know, it's, it's in the you know, hundreds of thousands of writes per cell. But eventually, to keep doing this, if you're just running a lot, you'll, you'll burn it out in a short amount of time. So nobody actually does what I'm describing here. Right? It is the easiest way to implement it, but nobody actually does this. The thing that he alluded to uh, that people have tried before is to basically store the changes you're making from uncommitted transactions in a temporary space. And then at some point when the transaction commits, you somehow resolve the, the, the directory or the page table to now say, here are actually the, the, correct, the latest versions of our, of our pages. And that way, if you crash, you just ignore anything that, that got modified in those, in those temporary buffers. So this is what shadow paging is. We, we briefly touched about this in the very beginning when we talked about current control. Uh, this is one way to do a no-steal force buffer pool management system that avoids some of the, the, the complications we talked about before. So the way shadow paging works, it's like it's sort of like multi-versioning, uh, but at the page level instead of at the tuple level. Uh, and there's only going to be two copies at any given time. So there's always the master copy, that's the latest, most recently committed version of, of the database. And then there's the, the shadow copy that all new transactions are going to end up modifying. So when a transaction commits, we want a way to atomically switch the, the, the shadow to become the new master. And we, we can do this in such a way that we don't worry about torn writes uh, if we're updating multiple pages. So 
unlike in, uh, in, in multi-versioning, where we just copy every single thing we're going to modify, uh, actually, it's like multi-versioning, but instead of doing it at a tuple level, you're doing it at a page level. And you can organize the, the directory of your pages as a tree structure. So now you only need to cat copy sort of portions of the tree and then just do path copying to, to update them in place or apply them to the, the, the page table without having to recreate the entire hash table all over again. So at the root of this tree is going to be the database root that's always going to point to the latest master, master version. So when, that means we can make a bunch of changes to the low portion of the tree, right, update the lease to point to, to our new pages that we just created. And then when we're ready to apply the changes to Atomic across all these pages, we just swing this database root pointer to now point to our shadow portion of the tree. And then all, all our changes get, get immediately, uh, become immediately visible. So a high level looks like this. Again, there's this database root, and it points to the master page table. And this master page table points to our pages out on disk. So I'm going to briefly go over this, but go through this sort of quickly, but let me just skip this, get to, get to the example. So say we have a transaction comes along, T1. Any transaction that's read-only can always go to this database root and go to the, the master copy and see a consistent version. But if we have an updating transaction, we have to create a shadow page table that, is, that the, the transaction is going to modify. So at the very beginning, the shadow page table, it just all its entries point to the same pages that the, the master page points to, the master page table points to. So now as this transaction starts modifying pages, we're going to make a copy of that page into a new location in our temporary space in, on disk, make all our changes there, right? And we keep doing this for all, all, the, other, all the other pages we want to modify. And then when this transaction says, I, I want to go ahead and, and commit, all we need to do is update this database root, which is stored on a single page, to now point to the, 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 this portion, the, or this page table, the shadow page table. So we flush that change out the disk, and then now it immediately becomes, that becomes, once that's durable, we then swing that pointer in memory, and then we now know that everyone can, can follow this one. So if a new transaction comes along, it wants to, it wants to, you know, wants to read what the latest version is of the, of the database, it just follows this route and finds the shadow page table. Yes. The question is, why is the database root written to disk? It's a pointer to a memory location. Right. So if I crash, right. So 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 I'm here. My trans transaction says I want to commit. I want to tell the outside world I committed. Right. <laughs> so if I don't update this database root, I crash and come back. And now I look at my database root, and it's pointing to the master page table, and all these changes are, are gone. Correct. Yes. It's 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 not a it's, I think it's, it's a page number. It's a page ID, right? That has to be durable because if I crash and come back, if I tell the outside world I commit, but then I crash, I'm like, all right, well, I just assume whatever this thing was pointing out is, is, the, is the root of the page table. And that means I told the outside world I committed, but now all my changes I made here in the shadow page table are gone. They're still there on disk. It's just no one can see them there. They're, you can't logically see them. So it's as if they didn't exist. When you say commit, you just write some changes on the pages that were committed, and you don't actually have to write the DB root out to disk. Like, because like, whenever you recover, you can look at all the pages and figure out what the most recent ones were or something like that. You qu your question is, can you be clever and figure out a way to, when you write out these pages, put a little mark in here to say, yeah, you're the latest version? Yeah, or something like that. So, all right, so this guy updated three, three pages. So I need to now record that, okay, you updated three, three out of X pages or N pages mm -hmm. to make sure that if I crash, come back, I see all those changes. Yeah, or like essentially like, because you know essentially on disk right now without ignoring the database route, you have some, some like out of, some out of date pages there, right? You essentially have to keep track of whichever, the database route tells you which ones are the most up to date ones. Yes. Essentially whenever a transaction commits, let's say you write some pages out to disk, 
for those t uh, pages right after this, you maybe have a timestamp associated with the transaction or something. Sure. You can just keep that there, and then you just look at that, and you can reconstruct the database route from that. My database is, is, is 100 petabytes. That, that be, this is one page that has everything I need. Always, again, always think in extremes. Yes? So um, if you have more than one transaction that want to make changes to the same page, do you be able both of them to commit? Or can you actually change? Excellent. So he said, and in my example here, I have one transaction. What if I have a bunch of transactions at the same time? How does this work? So you either have to have only one transaction run at a time, which SQLite does. Uh, or you, you have to commit them in a batch. So I say, all right, ignoring two-phase locking, because all that is, is orthogonal to this. Assume they you know, have a way to figure out who's allowed to update what. If I have multiple transactions within the same batch updating things, I have to wait until uh, they all finish. Then they all get committed. I swing my, my database root pointer, right? And then it get automatically applied. So that's one way to do this. If you assume all transactions are going to finish in a reasonable amount of time. If you have one transaction that takes an hour, then you either need to kill it after a certain amount of time or wait that one hour before everybody goes, goes ahead and commits. Some systems do this. It is rare. It's, most systems don't, don't operate this way. Actually, most systems don't even do shadow paging. Right? Um, IBM did this in System R in the 1970s. They abandoned it in the 1980s when they did DB2 because you have fragmentation issues. Right? So now I blow a master page table. I blow away these pages here because they're no longer visible. Right? So this is all that I have now, but it doesn't match up the ordering of pages here. So now when I do sequential scan, I, you know, I may not be reading things in the right order. So I can't do clustering indexes, is what they were trying to do back in the day. So nobody actually does this. But you're absolutely right. You have to either commit them to batch or have one transaction committed at a time. Yes? Uh, yeah, so why don't you just commit it on the fly, like in the previous example, when uh, you know, we made a change in the B and it asked for commit. So we just committed over here and then, uh, you know, we aborted A. So that will, this, this technique will handle that. Oh, so, so you're going back to the, the previous table where T1, T2. Yeah. Would that handle in this case? Yeah. Yes, if you assume T1 and T2 are committing together in the same batch, right? So yes, T, this, this will handle exactly that case. Because again, I have the undue information I need to reverse any tr changes that a transaction made in memory. So if, as long as that thing has been written out the disk, then I, I, I can just reverse it here and I'm fine. And if I crash before I flip the database root pointer, then I'm fine. Okay. So nobody actually does this. So, so let's jump through more quickly and get to the good stuff. Uh, so the reason why this sucks is because copying the entire page table uh, is expensive. You can, if, even if you use a tree structure, it becomes it's not cheap, um, and the commit overhead is high because you have to update, flush every single page that you modified, the page table and the root. The data becomes fragmented. You need a background garbage collector, just like in multi-version country control, and you either have to commit everything in a batch or only have one writer at a time. So as I said, the only systems I know that actually does do this um, were CouchDB, but I think CouchDB is giving is is going away from that and doing, um, they're switching over to RocksDB. Uh, LMDB is a tree-based system that uses MMAP, so that's sort of hidden from them. And then, uh, like it's a system R in the 1970s, but they, they abandoned that, IBM abandoned that in the 1980s. The one system you probably have heard about that does something similar to this is SQLite, but this is what SQLite did up until 2010. Then they ditched it too and switched to over what we'll talk about next, the write-ahead logging approach. So what SQLite would do is that instead of copying the um, instead of copying the page uh, that you would they're going to modify and then make the modification in the copy, they would copy the original page, write that out the disk, then make the modification to the master version, and then if you commit, you just blow away the the, the copy that you had, or if you crash before you commit, then you then you look back in that that separate copy file and restore the restore the change. So they would call this the journal file. So let's say that my transaction wants, wants to update page two. So before I modify page two in memory, I first make a copy to it and persist it on disk in a journal file. And then when, when that's done, I can modify it. Same thing with page three. Before I can modify it, I make a copy in the separate journal file. Then I go, go ahead and make my change. Now let's say before the, this transaction actually commits, 
we end up flushing out page two out the disk. But before we flush out page three and, and complete and actually commit this thing, we crash. And, right? So everything gets, gets blown away in memory. So when we come back, we would say, all right, well, I have a journal file. So I need, I need, I may need to make sure that all my changes that are in this, in this journal file, because these are the original versions, they get written out back to the, the, the original disk file. So again, like I said, this is what, this is what uh, SQLite did up until 2010, and then they abandoned this for performance reasons to use the right head log. Okay, so the shadow paging approach, it'll guarantee correctness, but it has some performance issues. And the main performance issue is going to be that it's, we're going to do a bunch of random I.O. So in my back, going back here in the SQLite example, when I had to replay the journal file, I'm updating random locations on, on disk to in order to restore the database back to the correct state. In the case of shadow paging, when I was flushing out all my changes and say my transaction actually committed, again, I'm doing random I.O. to different locations to persist all the changes from the, sh from the shadow, shadow copy. So even with the fast SSDs that we have today, sequential I.O. is always going to be faster than random I.O. So we need a way to convert all those random IOs into fast sequential IO and still have all the durability guarantees that, that we, we'd want in our logging protocol. So this is what write-ahead logging is, is going gonna, is gonna to achieve for us. So the idea with write-ahead log is that we're going to maintain a separate log file on non-volatile storage along with our table heap. And as transactions make changes to the database, we're going to make entries into this log file that record the changes that were made. And then when a transaction go has, goes at, wants to go ahead and commit, we just need to guarantee that we flush the log records that they generated out the disk and not the actual changes to the, to the objects or the pages in the buffer pool. So for owner for us, on right head log, and to say our transaction is committed and is durable, we only need to flush the log. We don't need to flush anything else. And so now the log file is just sequential I.O. because we just keep appending to this, this file, you know, with you know, page after page after page, that, again, that sequential I.O. is going to be much faster than the random I.O. of, of writing out the, the, the random pages. And again, the re reason why it's called write ahead log is because we need to make sure that any log record that corresponds to a change made to an object in the database is written to disk before that object can be written to disk. So that's the, that's the very important, most important thing to understand about write ahead logging. So right ahead logging is an example of steel and no force because we're going to be allowed to write dirty pages out the disk before transactions actually commit as long as their log records have been written out first. And then it's no force because we don't require all the changes that the transaction made to objects be written out the disk. We only require that the log records be written out the disk. So again, this is the most important thing you need to understand to, in order to understand the protocol. So. The way to think about this is like if I have a transaction that updates a thousand tuples, I potentially have to create a thousand log records. So let's say that thousand tuples are st stored in a thousand pages. My log records could just be stored in a single page. And therefore, I only need to want to write one, one page out to, to flush the log rather than all the, the pages that they were modified. So there's going to be a bunch of performance advantages we're going to get from this approach. So the, the database is going to stage all the changes that a transaction makes in these log records in volatile storage. This is typically ba also backed by the buffer pool. Um, and then again, this is we, we already talked about. Everything gets flushed out. And then we're not considered committed until we know that all our log records have been written out the, to disk as well. So the protocol is going to work this way. So when our transaction starts, we have to write a begin record into our log that's going to tell us that, hey, there's this transaction that started. It exists. Here's some metadata about it. Like, here's the identifier for it. And then when a transaction commits, we're going to write a commit record out to the log. And we need to make sure that this commit record appears in the log after any log record that corresponds to changes that the, that transaction made. It's going to be interleaved potentially with other changes that other transactions are making. But for our one transaction that we care about at this point in time, our commit record needs to appear after all its changes. Right? So once we see this commit in the log, we know there's no other change the transaction could ever make. So now in each log record, uh, for, for, 
in, in, in the very you know sort of initial simplistic version of the protocol I'm teaching right now, we need to re we need to record four things: the unique transaction identifier, right, like the timestamp, the transaction was signed when it was started, the object ID of the thing that I actually modified, and then the before value that corresponds to the undo, and then the after value that corresponds to the redo. So this information by itself is enough for us to be able to, that we need to in order to recover the database and for all possible failures that we talked about at the very beginning. So let's look at an example here. So we just have T1, does a write on A, write on B. And so now in memory, we have our write ahead log buffer as well as our buffer pool. So when we do the, the when a transaction starts and we begin, we're going to add an entry into our, our log record that says, hey, we, there's a transaction that just started. It's usually not done exactly when you call begin. It's usually done, unless you're running with auto commit turned on, it's usually done at the first write. But different systems can do different things. So now I do a write on A. So the first thing I need to do is add an entry to my log buffer that says, here's the, here's the change I'm, I'm making to A. Right? Here's, the here's the before value and here's the after value. And once that's in my log buffer, now I go ahead and make my change into my page in my buffer pool. All right. We'll talk about this more in that next class. The reason why you have to do this before this is because there's going to be this thing called the log sequence number that's going to get assigned to the log record that we have to use to figure out what was the, what's the log entry that, course, that, that changed this particular page. So you may think, who cares, and since I'm not writing out the disk, couldn't I just update this, this first, then add this thing in here? We'll see next, next, next class why you have to do this first followed by this. So then now I do the write on B, same thing. I add my entry to my redhead, a redhead log buffer in memory. Then I go ahead and make my change here. So now when I go ahead and do a commit, I add my commit record to my redhead log buffer. Then at some point, I'm going to flush it out the disk. In this case here, since we need to tell the outside world that a transaction is committed, we'll immediately flush this out, do an F sync. And once we know that's a durable and safe on disk, at this point, the transaction is considered safe to now return back to the application and say that it's, it's, it's committed. So now, who cares if Hitler comes along and kills, kills our buffer pool? Because everything we need to do to replay the changes that it made is now safe on disk. So if this page number got written out, we can just look in that log and replay it to, to update the, the, the page as needed. To do exactly the same thing the transaction did when it ran the first time. So again, at a high level, is this clear? Yes? Our question is, what if instead of storing the, the right ahead log buffer as a separate file, what if I stored it in the page itself? Oh, so are you talking about like the log structure storage we talked about earlier? Yeah, so in the log structure storage, you don't, you don't have this on disk, you only have this. Okay. Uh, so, so it does kind of take away the... Yeah, so log structure, yeah, correct. And the, the, what, you're, what you're giving up by ha not having this is that reads are now more expensive because you have to replay the log to figure out what the page actually should look like or on every read. Uh, but it makes writes super fast because now you don't do extra writes to write out dirty pages. You only keep appending things to the log. So there's a trade-off. So this would be like RocksDB, LevelDB, Cassandra, a bunch of different systems do these log structured merge trees, log structured storage. Okay, so, but you have yeah, for us, what we're talking about here, we're assuming we have table heaps. We're, like, everything we talked about, we have table heaps, we have a write ahead log. We're not doing the log structure stuff we talked about before. But the, the concept is still the same. You just, you just don't have this. You don't have the table heap. Uh, so his question is, if I have two transactions and they're, they're updating the database, are, are their log records intermixed in the same log buffer or they have separate log buffers? They're intermixed. Again, this is, this is, this is independent or orthogonal to the concurrent stuff. So some higher level part of the system that says, set, determines whether one transaction is allowed to update you know, w you know, this object or that object. At this point, we assume that they're allowed to do that and they did do it, they're going to do it, and therefore, we just, we just add their log records into the log file. Okay. 
We don't need we don't maintain separate log files for different transactions. Yeah, because we have the transaction ID. Because we, we have the transaction ID, we know who did what. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So again, if, if we crash, there's everything we need to, to re restore the database is, is in the log. So two sort of implementation questions. One is, when should the database system write out the log entries to disk? Well, it's obvious, as we said. It's whenever the transaction commits. Before we tell the outside world our transaction is going to go ahead, you know, is, is fully committed, we need to make sure that those log records in the buffer are now stored out, out on disk. Because that's all we need to be able to restore the database. But in my example here, I only showed one transaction. And when it said commit, you know, I just immediately did F sync and write it out. But that's actually going to be super slow. If, I've, if for every single transaction, I do an F sync when they commit to write out its log buffer. That's not what I'm going to want to do because say an F sync takes five milliseconds on, on a slower disk, then I can only commit one transaction every five milliseconds. And that, that, that's, going to be, that's going to be bad. I, I can only do 2,000 transactions a second. So what every system actually implements instead is what's called group commit, where you're going to allow multiple transactions to, to buffer up a bunch of changes in the log buffer, and then at some point you make a decision, all right, now I'm just going to go ahead and write whatever's in the log buffer out the disk. And that may include log records from transactions that have not committed yet, but that's fine because we know how to undo their, undo their changes because we have the undo information in the, in the log record. So this is what you're going to end up having to implement in, in Project 4. So the, the way it basically works is that in a simple form, you, instead of having one log buffer, you have two log buffers. It's sort of like shadow paging. There's the master, there's the, sort of the master one everyone's writing to, and there's the background one that you're eventually write to next. So when my transaction starts, T1 here does a write on A. Or, or, you always go to, you go to the first one first, add the um, begin, then you do the write on A, the write on B. Now I do a context switch here, right? Add T2's entry, do a write on C. But now at this point, my log buffer is full. So I can't add anything, any, anything else in here. So I'm going to go ahead and write this out the disk. Right? And, and, and I have to do an F sync, so that, you know, that's going to take some time. So in the meantime now, I switch over to, the, to my second log buffer. And now any other changes that transactions make get added to this thing here. The idea is sort of you know, while one's getting written out the disk, you fill up the next one. When that gets filled, then the, the, ideally the other one's been flushed out. So now then you write the, write the second one out and then fill up the first one. So you're just going back and forth. Uh, while one's getting flushed, you fill up the other one. But let's say for this transaction here, uh, it stalls, right? D it does something, right? It does additional computation. So neither transaction are generating new log records. So Instead of just waiting till it's filled up before I write it out, there's also a second prop uh, process where you, you say, well, if it's been a certain amount of time since, any, since I've last flushed this thing out, let me go ahead and, and flush it out. Right? And the idea is you, you want to tune it such a way that like, if you know the, the, what the f-sync time is to write something out the disk, then you sort of set your time out to be, to be that. So like, if, if it takes me five milliseconds to write the, write the first page out, the first log buffer, then I'll wait five milliseconds for the second one. And when well, five milliseconds is up, if I'm not full yet, I go ahead and write that out as well. So again, group commit basically says instead of one transaction f-syncing the log, when it commits, you batch a bunch of them together, and then you amortize the f-sync calls across multiple transactions. So if you're the first transaction that gets added to the, to the, the log buffer, and then you commit, you're kind of like, you're screwed because you have to wait the longest before you're actually written out the disk. But if you're the last guy, then it's as if you get the, you're getting the disk exactly to yourself because you're not waiting any time. So on average, this works out to be much better than everyone F-syncing immediately. All right, so then the, the last question is, when should we actually write the dirty records out the disk? Well, this depends now. So... Now that we said that the log buffer is everything we need to do, every, all the information we need to be able to redo the changes that transactions made, and we say that the log records that correspond to changes to pages are written out the disk before those pages are written out the disk, it's not actually immediately urgent for us to flush all those pages immediately when the transaction commits because the log records have been flushed. So now in our replacement policy and our buffer pool manager, we can account for this. We can say, all right, well, 
this thing is dirty, but I, the log record's been written out for it, so maybe I don't want to evict this one right away. Or I, or, or I can evict it right away, where this other one here, although it probably has a higher priority for me getting removed or getting evicted, its log records have, haven't been flushed yet. So maybe I don't want to evict that one because I had to flush the log buffer first before I can write that out. So this, this idea of logging recovery permeates throughout the entire system, and now we need to account for the other parts of the system that we, we've already talked about. We can update a replacement policy to keep track of these things. Yes? All right, so, so, so his question is, well, in these examples, we don't have any commits. Well, let's say that I have a commit in the log buffer, but before I write it at the disk, I crash. Yeah. Who cares? The application level was fake. Ah, uh, no, no, no. The application said commit. Yeah. We, we haven't told them that you committed yet. We only tell them that they commit when that log buffer that corresponds to that commit message is written to disk. That's the genius of this, right? Because again, the, the, if we're doing OCC, where we're doing validation after, after the transaction commits, we still might end up getting aborted, right? At this point here, the log buffer, we assumed all that's taken care of. So we see a commit message here. We don't tell, you know, there's no callback to say, yeah, you're good, everything's durable, until the log buffer's been written to disk. So the application level, they will harm His question is, is the application hanging for a while? Yeah. Yes. Correct. But I mean, like, what else would you do? Otherwise, if, if you don't want to wait to see what you committed, that's fine, but you could lose data. Right? So if I don't run with a transaction, then, then you know, actually, even, even if you do auto commit, you a single statement transaction, I think it's still going to write a, a, write a log record before it comes back and says your thing's actually finished. I don't. Some systems allow you, turn, allow you to turn off logging on a per transaction basis. So I can run a transaction that would say, I make a bunch of changes, but when I commit, don't write anything out to the log. You could do that. Some systems will allow you to do that. By default, they don't. Yes? Do we need to commit entries of a read-only transaction? Do we need to commit entries of a read-only transaction? Read-only transaction. A read-only His question is, do we need to commit entries for a read-only transaction? What do you think? What, what would you actually commit? What, what would the log record be? There's nothing, there's nothing to log. This is what I'm saying, like going back here. Uh, oh, shit, sorry. God damn it. Hmm. Oh, that wasn't me. That was PowerPoint. Sorry. So... I showed the, the, right, in this, in this case here, I showed that when the transaction started, I added begin entry. You don't have to do that, right? Because if, if it's a read-only transaction, like if this thing called begin, but then did a bunch of reads, then I'm storing crap that I don't care about. You could do that. You don't have to though, right? In some systems, you can actually declare a transaction read-only at the beginning. Like you say begin as read only or something in SQL, then you just turn off all logging and all concurrent control if you're doing snaps to isolation because you just know that I'm going to see exactly what I should be seeing. For simplicity, I'm showing that here. Yes? Uh, so, the question is when do you garbage collect the logs? A few more slides, we'll get there. Yes. It actually, is, 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 is. spoiler is checkpointing, but we'll get to that. Okay. So, uh, just to recap everything we talked about. The way to throw to think about the different methods for doing buffer pool management and recovery is in the context of the runtime performance and the recovery performance. So the runtime performance would be how fast is it for, you know, to, to maintain all this information while I run transactions. So in the case of no force steal, which is right ahead logging, that's gonna be the fastest during runtime because when I commit, I'm just committing out those log records. I don't worry about those dirty pages hanging in my buffer pool. I'll take care of them at some later point. Whereas with shadow paging, it's more expensive because I have to make sure I flush all the pages that I modified in my shadow page table, then flush the database root to disk before I can tell the outside world I committed.
But now the downside is if I have to recover the database after a crash, shadow paging is the fastest because I don't do anything extra. I just come back and my database root points to my shadow page, or the, 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 the consistent master, the most recently committed version, and I'm done. But under right ahead logging, that's actually going to be slower because I'm going to have to replay the log after some, some point, which she, she was sort of alluding to with garbage collection. So because of this trade-off between performance and recovery time, most database system implementations choose the, the right ahead logging, choose the no force steal, because they'd rather be faster at runtime and assume failure, failures are going to be rare, which, which you know, in the grand scheme of things, they are. Your database system is not crashing every minute. If you do, you have other problems. So therefore, they're willing to trade off faster runtime performance in exchange for slower recovery. There's only one system that I'm aware of, except for the ones that do uh, shadow paging, uh, like the old SQLite. There's only one system that actually makes the trade-off for having faster uh, recovery time in exchange for running slower at runtime. Uh, and it was this system, I don't know the name of it, uh, it was a database system built in the 1970s for the, the Puerto Rican electrical system. Because in Puerto Rico in the 1970s, they had power outages like every hour. So the data system was crashing literally every single hour. So for them, it was much better to be slow at runtime such that for every hour when you crash, when, the, when you lose power, you could recover the database immediately afterwards. Right? Another way to think about this at the high level too is this is with no undo, no redo, because there's nothing to reverse and nothing to reapply. With, with right ahead logging, you need undo and redo. All right, so I showed sort of at a high level what, what these log records are, that there's an object ID and then there's a uh, the before value and the after value. But what, how is that, this actually implemented? So there's a couple different approaches. So one, you know, one would be what is called physical logging, which is basically what I've talked about so far, is we're recording the low level byte changes to a specific location of some object in the database that you made to, you know, and, and you know how to reverse it. So think of this as like if you run diff or, or get diff, right? it's, 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 it allows you to get out the before and after image of, of the change. But the downside of this is, again, if I have to make, if I update a, you know, a billion tuples in my transaction, I have to have a billion log records that correspond to all those low-level physical changes. Another approach is do logical logging, where you just record the high-level operation that you, the, of the change you made to the database, and that's enough for you to be able to, to reapply it at, at runtime. Undo is a little more tricky, um, based if you have you know, based on what the actual query is. But let's ignore that for now. So think about, the way I think about this is, this is storing like in the, the diff of the change you made. This is storing actual the SQL query that, that uh, of the change you made. So the advantage or disadvantage of each of them are that logical logging allows you to record more changes with less data. I update a billion tuples with a single update statement. I only, only log that one update statement. The downside is going to be with logical logging, though, is that it's going to be tricky for me to figure out what changes I potentially made, made to the database that I've got written to disk before the crash because I don't have that low-level information. I update a billion tuples over a billion pages. Maybe half of them got written out to disk. How do I know which ones I, I need to update and reapply? The other issue is going to be also that however long it took me to update the database the first time when I ran the query with the logical logging scheme, it's going to take that same amount of time the second time. So my query took an hour to run. During recovery, it's going to take an hour to run again. There's no magic because I'm in recovery mode that's going to make that go faster. So although this again, storing, I'm storing less information with logical logging, it's going to make recovery more expensive. And most systems do not make that change. The hybrid approach that most people use is called physiological logging, where you're not going to store the low-level byte information about the changes you're making to the database. You'll still, you'll still store, like, it's low-level enough to say, here, at this page, I'm modifying this object, but you're not, you're not really taking a diff as you would under physical logging. You're just saying, here's this logical thing I want you to make a, make a change to. So this is what most systems actually implement. So let's say we have this update query here. So under physical log, it would be like, at this page, at this offset, here's the before and after image. 
And we haven't talked about indexes as well, but indexes, you basically have to log in the, uh, the same time you're making changes to the database because if my, if my index doesn't fit in memory, then I don't want to have to rebuild it from scratch upon recovery. So most database systems also re record the, the or log the changes you make to the indexes. Logical logging in this query, again, you just store the SQL statement. Physical logical logging is you're just saying at this page, at this slot number, here's the change I want you to make to these, these low level attributes. And this allows you to not have to, um, by having these, this extra indirection, sort of like the slot of pages, it doesn't, it allows you to sort of reorder the, the, the replay operations in such a way that the, the, the database doesn't need to byte for byte copy before and after the crash, you have some wiggle room to actually uh, reapply these in, in different ways and restore, still restore back to the correct state. All right, so the, the getting to, to, to her question is, the issue of everything we talked about so, fo so far is that these right ahead logs are gonna grow forever. If my database system is running for a year, I'm gonna have a year's worth of logs. So now if I have to crash, if I crash and I have to come back and have to replay this log, I potentially have to replay the entire year's worth of data. So logical logging, that would be terrible, right? Because if, again, the query takes the same amount of time it took the first time as, as it does during recovery. So I have a year's worth of data of, of logical log records. If I crash and come back, I potentially take a year for me to recover the database. So that's bad. So the way we can truncate the, the log is through what are called checkpoints. And the idea of a checkpoint is that we're gonna flush out all the pages that are dirty in our, in our buffer pool out the disk and add an entry to our log record to say, at this point, there's no dirty pages that are not durable in disk. So therefore, you don't need to replay that far in the, in the past, potentially, from, 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 from my checkpoint. Because I know all those changes have been persistent. Again, the idea here is, again, because we're, we're doing the steel policy, uh, or the no force policy, we're not requiring that the dirty pages that a transaction made has to be flushed out the disk before the transaction is committed. So we don't know whether they actually made it to disk or not if, if we crash. Whereas with the checkpoint, when we know the checkpoint completes, we know that at that, that point, everything has been written to disk. So let's look at a really simple example here. So for this one, I'm gonna use a very simplistic checkpointing scheme that basically stops the world, stops all transactions from running and flushes out all their changes, all the dirty pages out to disk. And then once I know all those dirty pages are written, then I let them start running again. And this is called consistent, consistent checkpointing or blocking checkpoints. Most systems don't actually implement it this way. We'll see on Wednesday how to do it better and how things can run at the same time. But just understand at a, you know, the very basic, uh, how the basic protocol works, assume that's the case. So I have this, I'm gonna add this checkpoint entry here. So what'll happen is when I take this checkpoint, I stop all transactions from running and I flush out any dirty pages. And so now if I have a crash, when I come back, I know that I don't need to look at any T1, T1's changes because T1 committed before my checkpoint. So I know all the T1's changes are written to disk. So I don't need to replay and look at its log. It's the other two guys, T2 and T3, those guys started and could potentially made change before my checkpoint. So I need to go back in the log up to that point and figure out what they actually did to put my database back in the correct state. So in the case here, T2 committed uh, before the crash. So I know I wanna reapply its changes or redo their, its changes. T3 did not commit before the crash. So I would know I, I wanna reverse its changes, right? So the checkpoint is basically just again, just telling us that we know that at this point in time, all dirty pages from any transactions have been written to disk. And it's up for us to then figure out, well, what came slightly before the, the checkpoint and what came after the checkpoint to decide who's allowed to actually uh, have their changes persisted. So again, we'll talk about checkpoints more on Wednesday, but in my simple example here, I stalled all the transactions to make my life easier. Because if I have a transaction that's updating a bunch of pages, I don't want to have the case, or it, it could be, I have to do some extra work to figure out, well, I'm updating 20 pages and my checkpoint flushed out the first 10 pages that transaction modified, but then while the checkpoint was running, it modified these other ones and I didn't flush those things out. So I don't, I don't want to figure out which ones actually should, should be around. The 
other tricky thing is going to be it's not clear how often we should should take a checkpoint because these checkpoints aren't free because we're writing out dirty pages and that's slowing slowing the disk when we could be writing out to a log now in a lot of systems they'll have the disk the log be stored on separate disks and the, and the heap files are sort of separate disks so when you're doing f syncs on both of them you're not slowing down e each other but again now my checkpoint is running out dirty pages when i could have been you know evicting pages for for disk to 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 re get new space in my buffer pool to have other transactions keep on running. So how often you take a checkpoint can vary based on the implementation. So the one approach is to say every after every every certain number of minutes or, or seconds, take the checkpoint. Uh, if I do that, then my recovery time is much faster because now I don't need to go as far back in the log to refigure out what should be actually persisted because my checkpoint is occurring uh, more frequently. Because now the checkpoints are, are slowing me down, so my my runtime performance suffers. Another approach, which I actually think is better, is that the checkpoint only occurs after a certain amount of data has been written out to the log. Like after I've written out 250 megabytes of data to the log, then I take a checkpoint, and that that bounds the amount of time you have to wait, uh, and you don't worry about um, you know wh whether you're you're taking checkpoints un unnecessarily. Because it's, it's your, you know, I know that I only need to look at maybe at most 250 megabytes of the log before I have to recover my database. Again, I'm going over this very, very, very fast because we're running out of time. Uh, but we'll cover this in more detail uh, when we talk about recovery on on Wednesday. So, any any high level questions about checkpoints? Thing at checkpoint is like garbage collection for for the write ahead log. But I know that at that at that point of the checkpoint, I don't potentially need to look at anything that came before it. Of course, in, in the extreme case, if I, have a, if I have a transaction that runs for days and I'm taking a checkpoint every five minutes, then I need to go back to, to when that transaction started to figure out what all changes it actually made. Okay, so as I said, right ahead logging is, is almost always the preferable approach, the, the better approach to handle uh, avoiding uh, data loss or make sure that our database system is durable on disk. And the core idea of what's gonna, how it works is that it's going to use steel no force buffer pool management policy. It's going to flush all changes that transactions made to their log records to disk before we tell the outside world that a transaction is committed. And then in the background at some later point, we can flush out those, those dirty pages. But we have to write the log records first before we can write out the dirty pages that they modified. And so on recovery, we just undo any, any changes from uncommitted transactions. And then we redo the commit changes, committed cha redo the changes of any committed transactions to make sure that they get applied. Yes. His question is: We have to undo potentially changes on recovery. Again, we'll cover that on Wednesday, because changes from uncommitted transactions could have those dirty pages could have been written out of the disk because we're using the steel policy. So the scenario where we don't actually have to undo, we have to check if we actually do need to undo. His question is: uh, His question is: Are there scenarios where, upon recovery, we would not have to undo because we can look at did our changes actually make it out the disk? The no. The the spoiler would be for Wednesday. You redo everything. You go, you're going to go through the log multiple times. You're going to redo everything. But then as you redo, you say, oh, I see this transaction didn't commit. Then you go back and reverse on the log and you undo anything that, that is on. So you, you, you just, you play it safe and you always undo. There are some optimizations, but I, I don't think most people do them. All right, so on Wednesday's class, again, it would be the second part of what we talked about for logging recovery. It's the things we do after a crash or after a restart. How do we use the right head log? How do we use the checkpoints to put us back in the correct state? So this is probably the third hardest part of, of, of database systems. So the thing we're talking about is Aries. Aries is the, the gold standard of how you do database recovery. I don't know whether the textbook calls it Aries, um, but and most systems that implement right head log are not going to call it what they're doing Aries. But everybody that does right head logging is going to be based on the IBM's protocol from the 1990s. Whether or not they know that, they're, using, they're basically using Aries. OK? All right. Uh, I'm having office hours now at 1.30, and um, see you guys on Wednesday. Oh dear, coming through with my shell and crew. Two cent for a case, give me St. Oz In the midst of broken bottles and crushed up cans. Met the cows in the jam, oh how dry I am.
with St. Ives in my system. Crack another, I'm blessed. Let's go get the next one and get over. The object is to stay sober. Lay on the sofa. Better yet, down my shoulder. Who be the wild? I'll be stressed out. Could never be son. Rick and say jelly. Hit the deli for a cold one. Naturally blessed, yes. My rap is like a laser beam. The boards in the bushes. St. Ives been the king of teens. Crack the bottle of the St. Ives. Sip it through those who don't realize. The drinking ain't only to be drunk. You can't drive. Keep my people still alive. And if the saint don't know you from a can of paint, paint. 